This year is the 25th anniversary for KIAS. To celebrate this anniversary, we are starting the quadrant centennial KIAS lectures. The first physicist to invite as a speaker for this memorable lecture is surely Professor Edward Witten. We are very honored that he has accepted our invitation. Professor Witten received a PhD in 1976 at Princeton under the super supervision of David Cross. He received numerous awards, among them Fields Medal, Found Fundament Fundamental Physics Prize, Crawford Prize, and Kyoto Prize. Professor Witten is the only physicist who received Field, the Fields Medal. Fields Medalist Michael Atia once said, Witten has made a profound impact on contemporary mathematics. In his hands, physics is once again providing a rich source of inspiration and insight in mathematics. Professor Witten used to say that there is a difference between understanding what is true and understanding why it is true. He added that this difference is an important part of the fascination of physics and mathematics. In today's lecture, I hope will be able to understand what is true and understand why it is true. Then hopefully after Witten's lecture, the difference will fascinate us physically and mathematically. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I mean, today's speaker, this week's speaker is uh, Edward Witten from Institute for Advanced Study. As uh, Professor Che, the president of KIAS already introduced, I mean, he is the giant of our generation when it comes to theoretical physics. And if there is anybody who doesn't need introduction, I guess it will be Edward. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, let's welcome Edward. Thanks. Thanks so much, President Kay, and also Piljin for the very kind uh, introductions. And thanks for the opportunity to give these lectures. I hope uh, at some point in the not too distant future, we'll get to meet in person. So as the title indicates, my talk topic for these lectures will be black hole thermodynamics then and now. I'll start with a review of just some of what was achieved in the 1970s, and then we'll try to get up to more contemporary developments. So after, as I said, reviewing some of what happened in the 70s, I'll try to give an introduction to the new perspective of roughly the last 15 years. And as we'll see, the focal point of the new perspective is a microscopic notion of entropy. Black hole thermodynamics started in 1972 when Beckins, jo Jacob Beckenstein, who was a student of John Wheeler and was inspired by questions from Wheeler, asked what the second law of thermodynamics means in the presence of a black hole. The second law says that for an ordinary system, the entropy can only increase. However, if we toss a cup of tea into a black hole, the entropy seems to disappear. Bakkenstein wanted to generalize the concept of entropy so that the second law would hold even in the presence of a black hole. So for this, he wanted to assign an entropy to the black hole. Well, he needed a property of the black hole that can only increase. What is that? You might think that the mass of a black hole always increases, but that's actually not true. And by this time, it was known to not be true through the work of Chris Sedula and Penrose, among others. If, for example, if a black hole is rotating, it can lose mass as its rotation slows down. And it's even believed that this is astrophysically important because it's believed that the source of the energy in the jets that we see coming out of galaxies comes from the rotational energy of a black hole in the center. So black hole mass is not a good candidate for entropy. But there is a quantity that always increases. Stephen Hawking had just proved the area theorem, which says that the area of the horizon of a black hole can only increase. For now, we'll just accept it. But actually, I think in the second lecture, I'll give a sketch of the proof. So it was fairly natural for Bekenstein to propose that the entropy of a black hole would be a multiple of the horizon area. 
For example, what I've written here is the metric of what's called a Schwarzschild black hole of mass M, where Schwarzschild black hole is simply a non-rotating black hole, a rotationally symmetric black hole. It's described by this particular solution of Einstein's equations, the Schwarzschild solution. And for this solution, the horizon is at r equals 2 gm, which is the point at which the coefficient of dt squared in the metric changes sign. So time stops behaving like a time coordinate and starts to behave like a space coordinate. And r, the radial coordinate, does the opposite because this coefficient also changes sign. So the horizon is at 2 gm. The area is simply 4 pi r squared, which with this value of the radius is 16 pi times g squared m squared. So Beckenstein's idea was that the entropy of a Schwarzschild black hole would be a, mul a multiple of this quantity. Since entropy is dimensionless, to relate the entropy of the black hole to its area, one needs a constant of proportionality with dimensions of area. From the fundamental constants h bar z and g, g is Newton's constant. You can make the Planck length and the Planck area, L Planck squared. So in units where the speed of light is one, Beckenstein's formula for the entropy was what I've written here, except that the constant one quarter was not clear in Beckenstein's work and was provided a few years later by Stephen Hawking in a way that I will explain. So for a Schwarzschild black hole, the area is what we computed a moment ago. So the Beckenstein Hawking entropy is given by this expression. Now, physicists often use units where h bar is one, and I will sometimes do so, but it's useful to include the one over h bar in these formulas to explain why black hole entropy is so large. For example, if you take m to be the mass of the sun, you discover that the entropy of a black hole, which is the mass of the sun, is roughly 10 to the 20 times bigger than the entropy of the actual sun. Now, Beckenstein's idea was that the entropy of a black hole captures the information lost when the black hole was formed. He interpreted it as the logarithm of the number of ways the black hole could have formed. And he proposed a generalized second law saying that the generalized entropy always increases. The generalized entropy is the ordinary entropy of radiation and matter outside the black hole, S out, and we'll try to give a better definition of it later, but for now, it's just the ordinary entropy outside the black hole. And so the generalized entropy is the black hole area over four GH bar plus the ordinary entropy outside the black hole. So Beckenstein proposed that the generalized entropy always increases. The claim is that when something falls into the black hole, the entropy outside the black hole goes down, but the area over four GH bar increases by more. Beckenstein made a few tests of this idea, and I'll explain what's perhaps the most important. Shine photons with a wavelength lambda and therefore energy E equals one over lambda on the black hole. The entropy of a single photon is of order one. For example, the photon has two polarization states, which would give it an entropy of one in bits. When the black hole absorbs one photon, its mass shifts by one over lambda, or lambda is the wavelength. So its entropy four pi gm squared is shifted from what was before to the same thing with m replaced by m plus one over lambda. So to first order in the small change one over lambda, the change in the entropy of the black hole is eight pi g times m over lambda. Now Beckenstein wanted the change in the black hole entropy, which is this, to be bigger than the change in the entropy outside, which is of order one. So he wanted this inequality. And he observed that if the black hole is capturing a photon whose size is no smaller than the radius of the black hole, or the diameter of the black hole is twice the Schwarzschild radius or four GM. So if, for example, lambda is less than 4 gm, then the black hole entropy changes by at least 2 pi. And that's satisfactory because the photon entropy was more like 1. 
He did a more complete calculation, letting the black hole rotate and making a better estimate of the entropy per photon of thermal radiation, for example, that you might shine on the black hole. But he got satisfactory results, as long as this inequality was satisfied. But the calculation shows you that if lambda is too small, you will not get a satisfactory result. If lambda is too small, then um, this isn't going to work because uh, the entropy per unit energy of the black hole of the photon was too large. So Beckinsian's answer worked well as long as the black hole is absorbing photons of wavelength larger than the black hole size, which can happen, though not very efficiently. This is sorry, sorry. Sorry. Beckinsian got a good answer if the photons have a short wavelength compared to the size of the black hole. But now imagine a black hole in empty space and there's a photon whose wavelength is much longer. In that case, Beckinsian didn't get a satisfactory answer because in that case, the entropy per unit energy of the photon is too large. Now this question really does not have a satisfactory answer in the framework Beckenstein was assuming, which was that whatever falls behind the black hole horizon stays there forever. In thermodynamic terms, since, black hole, since Beckenstein assumed that the black hole doesn't radiate, one would want to assign it a temperature of zero. Thermodynamics says that at equilibrium, the changes in energy and entropy S of a system are governed by dE equals T dS, where T is the temperature, or dS equals dE over T. So if T is zero and dE is not zero, the change in entropy should be infinity. But Beckenstein was trying to attribute a finite, not infinite entropy to the black hole. So his assumptions weren't really consistent with thermodynamics. In hindsight, the problem is that, as we learn later, the black hole is emitting these long wavelength photons as Hawking radiation. And one can't analyze the absorption of very long wavelength photons by the black hole while ignoring the fact that the black hole is strongly emitting such photons. Famously, Stephen Hawking discovered a couple of years later that quantum mechanically, a black hole is not really black. It has a temperature proportional to Planck's constant H bar. Hawking supposedly was trying to, believed Beckenstein was wrong and was trying to disprove Beckenstein's idea, but in the process, he ended up proving it. Hawking discovered this by analyzing the behavior of quantum fields in a black hole geometry. Now, a black hole geometry is a four-dimensional pseudo-Romanian geometry. So we can't nicely draw a four-dimensional space-time in a way we can really vi easily visualize. What people usually draw is what's called a Penrose diagram. Here we assume that the black hole is spherically symmetric, a non-rotating black hole. So there are two additional coordinates in the picture not drawn, the, the angles of rotational symmetry. What's drawn is only the time and the distance from the origin. Time runs vertically and the distance from the origin is plotted horizontally, but they're not plotted in their usual way which would make a picture that's very hard to understand. They're plotted in a conformal picture due to Penrose, which shows the causal relations. In a Penrose diagram, a light ray travels at a 45 degree angle to the vertical. So the horizontal lines in the picture, sorry, the diagonal lines in the picture all represent light rays. They're not perfectly parallel because the picture was drawn by hand. So, this diagonal line here represents the horizon of the black hole. So a particle traveling at the speed of light that's outside the horizon can avoid falling in. It goes diagonally parallel to the horizon. If it's behind the horizon, it can't escape. It can go diagonally parallel to the horizon, but it will never escape to the right of the horizon. The wiggly line at the top is what's called the black hole singularity. An object behind the horizon, even if it travels diagonally at the speed of light, will end its life at the horizon. In this picture, past infinity is also a diagonal line. 
and future infinity is another diagonal line. A particle that emerges to spatial infinity at the future, if it reaches the future at this going out at the speed of light, will arrive at what's actually called future null infinity out here. A massive particle that travels less than the speed of light will reach infinity just at this point in the diagram. So this diagram captures causal relations, but not fully the geometry. In your mind's eye, you have to imagine that the geometry blows up near this point. So the time of, of a few, the time of a future observer can be thought of as a function on this diagonal line here, but the time goes to infinity as we approach this point. So I've tried to explain the basics of a Penrose diagram. Uh, I hope that a decent fraction of the physics students will be familiar with it already. Otherwise, I hope my explanation will at least enable you to at least partly understand what I'll explain next. Now, measurements that an observer makes at future infinity can be traced back to initial conditions of the fields on a Cauchy hypersurface. A Cauchy hypersurface is just an initial value surface or initial conditions can be stated for all classical or quantum fields. But because we'll be doing quantum field theory, we'll think of initial conditions for quantum fields on the Cauchy hypersurface. So a Cauchy hypersurface could be any space-like hypersurface in the picture. That simply means any hypersurface that's more horizontal than vertical. Its tangent is at less than a 45 degree angle to the horizontal. So I've drawn an example of a Cauchy hypersurface here, although a partial one because it ended at future infinity in blue. The blue, the, we're only really going to be interested in the part near the horizon, but the blue is a line on which we could think of posing initial data. In introducing the Penrose diagram, I forgot to explain what this red is. The red is the part of space-time filled by a star. The star emerged from the past. It looks like it came from a point, but again, the well, it's like a, um, uh, it's like a map, well, in an ordinary map, the north and south poles are often blown up. In a Penrose diagram, the opposite happens. The past and the future are collapsed to points just so that we can visualize causal relations more effectively. So the star looks like it came from a point, but it really was a good healthy star in the past. It eventually collapsed to a black hole. It fell behind the horizon. And I've chosen a Cauchy hypersurface, which is to the future of the collapsing star in the part of it we care about which is the part that crosses the horizon. That means that the part of the discussion that will be important is for a part of the space-time that is essentially empty space, vacuum if you'd like. The white, the red is the part of space filled by the star and the white is basically vacuum. And we'll be analyzing a portion of the space-time which is just empty space basically. So signals propagating at the speed of light from the initial value surface will reach the observer at infinity. Remember the observer at infinity is making measurements along this diagonal black line. And a signal from the initial value surface behind the horizon will never get to the observer at infinity. One that is from outside the horizon will reach the observer at infinity. But the important thing is that the, cl the, the closer you start to the horizon, the later it will be when you reach infinity. So a signal that starts way out here reaches future infinity at a certain time, but the signals that were closer to the horizon reach future infinity closer to that corner, which is time infinity. So signals that originate closer and closer to the horizon arrive at the distant observer later and later. Part of Hawking's insight was that although the full details of exactly what you'll see as a distant observer, depends on the details of the collapsing star. If you ask what you'll see in the far future after transients die down, there's a universal answer. There's a universal answer because a signal that's received very late originated very close to the horizon. And that means that observations made at light times depends on measurements of the state of the, state of the quantum field at very short distances, very close to the horizon. But every state is equivalent to the vacuum at short distances. So therefore, the details 
of the star and so on won't be important. We'll just be probing the vacuum at short distances. The late time observations of the observer probe the vacuum state near the horizon at short distances. What are meant here by late time and short distances? Well, late time simply means time compared, late compared to how long it took for the star to collapse and the transients to die down. So for example, for a black hole with the mass of the sun, anything a lot more than a hundredth of a second is late time. So one second after the star collapses is a very late time from this point of view. And certainly if you look at a black hole in astronomy, you're always seeing them at very late times, except for LIGO, which sees gravitational waves from the actual collapse. Well, what about short distances? Well, short distances only mean short distances compared to the size of the black hole. So for example, for a black hole with the mass of the sun, its radius would be a few kilometers. So a millimeter is a very short distance. So when I say short distances, I don't mean distances so short that we don't understand physics. We'll be probing the vacuum at distances of a millimeter or whatever, long compared to the size, sorry, short compared to the size of the black hole, but much longer compared to the scale at which we understand physics. So we'll be doing this calculation in a region where we're confident that we understand the physics. So that's why Hawking got a universal answer for the late time behavior, regardless of exactly how the black hole formed. The black hole is long gone by the time we're looking at these initial data on the, this, hyper, this blue hypersurface outside the horizon. And the later are the observations of the observer, the farther in the future can this hypersurface be and the farther to the future of the star. So we really are just discussing physics that happens in empty space outside the black hole. So now I'm going to draw a picture. We forget about the star, it's way over on the left. We just zero in on a small part of the picture that matters. This diagonal black line is the horizon. This diagonal black line represents the far future. It's parameterized by T, the time of an observer infinity, which diverges at this corner. And U is a coordinate that vanishes on the horizon and its derivative on the horizon is in the normal direction is non-zero. It vanishes in first order in the horizon and we don't care anything more about it. Any such U will do. T will be the time at which a signal that starts at U on this red, red I've now drawn in red, a piece of a initial value surface and a signal that reaches that that leaves that surface at a position u will arrive in the future at a time t. Excuse me just a second. And um, the relation between u and t, this is a very important formula, which you can find in books on classical general relativity. The relation between u and t is that, well, as I said, the time diverges as the signal starts from closer and closer to the horizon. And in fact, it diverges logarithmically. If you start a very small distance from the horizon, the time at which you escape to infinity is logarithmically large. Now, I didn't tell you exactly how to define u, so this isn't a precise formula. If you rescale u by a constant, that will just add a constant to t. That won't really matter because I haven't told you at what time the distant observer zeroed the clocks. And if you make a nonlinear change in u, that will add irrelevant terms of order u to this formula. The important thing is that no matter how u is defined, the time at which the signal reaches infinity is 4gm times the logarithm plus bounded, a bounded correction. You find this by solving the geodesic equation for an outgoing null geodesic. Now, and when I say that the time is logarithmically big, that might not sound so dramatic, but it comes dramatic if we invert it and solve for u in terms of t. If we solve for u in terms of t, we see that u is a constant times the exponential of minus t over 4gm. So that means that when t becomes large, u becomes exponentially small. So for example, if the black hole has a few kilometers in size and t is point, 
one second or something, 100 times the time for the collapse to occur, then u will be incredibly small, much smaller than we need it to be for the calculation we'll want to do. So um, it, it, t doesn't have to be very big to be in the light time region for this calculation. Now, not only is u exponentially small, but u dt is exponentially small. That means a mode observed at infinity will have undergone an exponentially large redshift on its way. So whatever frequency the observer at infinity sees that photons have, it had a much, much bigger frequency when it started on the initial value surface. And exactly what frequency it had when it started depends on which initial value surface we, we picked. We could have gone farther back and it would have started at even higher energies. For our discussion, we just want to start far enough back that whatever is being observed by the distant observer started with a wavelength much less than the size of the black hole. So there's going to be a simple answer because the observations originate from very high energies near the horizon. A mode of very high energy propagates freely along the diagonal outgoing geodesics I've been drawing. So, so these purple lines are the orbits of massless outgoing particles. A very high energy outgoing particle just propagates to infinity along one of those diagonal lines. And that means there's a simple transformation from what's what, from the input near the horizon and the output at infinity. Well, what does the observer at infinity measure? The observer at infinity measures the radiation by measuring a quantum field. For example, a quantum field psi of t. A typical observer, observable is a two-point function. So in the state of the outgoing stuff that's emerging from the black hole, the distant observer measures a two-point function or maybe a more sophisticated three-point function or a four-point function of quantum fields. For example, if, if for simplicity, the field psi is a free fermion with dimension one half in the one plus one dimensional sense. Okay, psi, okay. We're imagining a spherically symmetric black hole. So each partial wave, each angular momentum mode can be treated independently of the others. And the problem effectively involves a one plus one dimensional quantum field where the two important dimensions are the distance and the time. And Effectively, we're looking at a massless mode. See, uh, the two dimensions that count are the two drawn in this picture. And so we're effectively discussing a one plus one dimensional quantum field in this picture. And we're looking at modes that are what are called right moving modes, modes that travel to infinity at the speed of light. So at infinity, the observer infinity is effectively measuring a one plus one dimensional quantum field for each angular momentum mode. So for example, suppose that the mode which is being measured is what quantum field theorists call a free fermion. That means the two-point function in the vacuum at short distances has a simple pull, one over u minus u prime. So I has dimension a half, so I've put the du du prime to the one half in the numerator. Now setting u equals the constant times the exponential of minus t over four gm, we simply take this standard free field expression near the horizon make this change of variables and learn what the observer at infinity would measure. The observer at infinity would measure this. And that's not the two point function in the vacuum, definitely not. If you want to know what it is, the quickest way to answer is that this function is anti-periodic in imaginary time. It's odd under a shift of the time by eight pi g n times the square root of minus one. Well, as one learns when one studies quantum statistical mechanics, anti-periodicity corresponds to a thermal correlation function at a temperature, which is the inverse of the period. So the temperature, which we now call the Hawking temperature is one over eight pi gm. In other words, a black hole after transients that depend on how it was created die down, radiates thermally at a temperature, the Hawking temperature, one over eight pi gm. This explains why Bekenstein had, had trouble making sense of the interaction of the black hole with low energy photons. 
It also lets us confirm the value of the entropy using dE equals TDS, where E is the mass of the black hole and T is one over eight pi gm. We get that dS is eight pi gm dm. So integrating S is four pi gm squared. The area of a Schwarzschild black hole was 16 pi g squared m squared as we computed before. So the entropy is the area over four g. And that's how Hawking confirmed Bekenstein's result and also determined the constant one fourth. Now, I think this might be a reasonable time to stop for questions if there are any. Hello, hello. Sorry, I have a question uh, in previous slide. Why you say that's a temperature? Sorry, I get lost in this part. The uh, previous slide. Well, uh, yes, I yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what I should assume is known, but um, a thermal ensemble. Uh, okay. A thermal, I wonder if I can write on this. A thermal ensemble has to do with the density matrix, e to the minus the Hamiltonian divided by the temperature. Yes. And when you do correlators with respect to such an ensemble, you'll find that they're periodic in imaginary time. The reason for imaginary time is that real time would be e to the minus i h t where t is the real time. So comparing the formula for real time propagation to a thermal ensemble, you see that the temperature, the relation between the two is that imaginary time behaves like temperature or one over temperature. Just at i t equals one, i times time equals one over the temperature. Okay, okay. Um, it's a basic fact in quantum statistical mechanics. It's hard to explain it briefly better than I just did. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Uh, can I also ask a question about this? Yes, please. Uh, you know, is the argument that you provided on this slide about Hawking temperature, is it more rigorous than the Euclidean gravity, this shortcut derivation? Normally, if you change T into minus I tau of Schwarzschild black hole, demanding the regularity gives Hawking temperature. Is this oh. more rigorous than that? Well, I consider the, first of all, what I've explained is closer to Hawking's original explanation. I think it's more satisfying because physics happens in Lorentz signature. Okay, the question is about a very clever short derivation that was found a few years later by Hawking and Gibbons, and which unfortunately I'm not going to explain in these lectures because there won't be time to explain everything. The explanation you're quoting is very snazzy and, okay. I worked hard to, I think this explanation is more physical. I'm not sure it's more rigorous, but I think it explains more. And I really think one should understand it first. I think after understanding this explanation, one also wants to understand the explanation you've mentioned. For a lot of people, not includes me, it was the other way around. The explanation you've mentioned is easier to understand. I understood it for years before I understood this explanation. Thank you very much. Sure. I see something in the chat, uh, except I can't. Uh, it, it, are there more questions? Um, there are questions in the chat. Um, okay, the one about the generalized second law we'll get to uh, in the second lecture. I think I want to postpone it. Okay, both questions uh, both questions concern the following, I think. Since the black hole is radiating, its mass is going down. So the black hole, the entropy of the black hole is going down. But you have to decide if the generalized second law is that satisfied, you have to remember that the radiation the black hole emits carries some entropy. And in the second lecture, we'll calculate the sum of the two and show it increases. But I don't want to take time to do that now. So 
both questions in the chat have to do with something I'll explain in two days. Thursday, your time, Wednesday for me. Um, maybe I'll go on if there aren't more questions. So we've learned that a black hole after transients that depend on how it was created, die down, radiates thermally at a temperature one over eight pi gm. And that explains why Beckenstein had had trouble making sense of the interaction of the black hole with low energy photons. Oh, sorry, I explained this already. Sorry. Now, many researchers have thought that somehow the entropy being proportional to the area means that the black hole can be described by some sort of degrees of freedom that live at its surface. One bit or qubit for every one over four G of area. A qubit is just a quantum particle with one bit of quantum entropy. So for example, John Wheeler wrote a famous article in 1992 where he illustrated this, that idea with this picture. So I took this picture from an article he wrote in 1992, but my guess is Wheeler had been drawing this picture for 20 years by that time. So he divided the black hole horizon into little segments with one over 4G area. And he imagined that each segment contains a spin one half particle or whatever with one unit of entropy. Now, I might say that most researchers today believe that there's some truth in that idea, although we still don't understand it well. Now, a fundamental point about Hawking radiation is that the radiation appears to be thermal, even though the black hole could have been formed from a pure state. And we want to uh, understand this more thoroughly. The reason that this happened is that the observations of the distant observer amount to observing a quantum field that lives in one plus one dimensions, or only half of space. Remember, the two important dimensions were space and time. But in the previous pictures, I labeled one dimension as u. And the observer made observations only for positive u. So u could also be negative, but the observations were made only for positive u. And that's what leads to the thermal behavior. And now we're going to look at that part of the story in isolation. But I'm going to call this parameterized spatial direction by x. So the thick part of this line for positive x is where we will make observations. And the thin part for negative x, we will not make observations. We're going to, forgetting about gravity and black holes, we're going to consider a quantum field that lives in one plus one dimensions, or there could be more dimensions perpendicular to this picture, but there'll be one space dimension that's important, but we're going to imagine we make observations only where X is positive, not where X is negative. So we think of the ground state of a quantum field. Well, first of all, we think of a quantum field as a function five X, that's a function of the real variable X. And then the ground state of a quantum field or any state of a quantum field is a function psi that depends on phi of x. The ground state is a particular function of phi of x. Now we're going to think of phi as a pair, phi left and phi right, where phi left consists of the, the values of x, of phi rather, on the left half line, and phi right are the values on the right half line over here. So there's a constraint that phi left and phi right agree at x equals zero, but that won't be very important. Ignoring that one point, phi right labels the positive values of x and phi left the negative values. So the ground state is a function of both phi left and phi right. But we're going to discuss how to make a density matrix appropriate if we observe phi right only. Let's remember the general idea of a density matrix. We start with a pure state psi AB in a tensor product Hilbert space. We have a quantum system that consists of two parts and our application the two parts will be the right half and the left half of the line. But in general, we have two parts represented by Hilbert spaces HA and HB. And we'll begin with a pure state psi AB and what's called the density matrix of a pure state is just the projection operator onto that state. Now, if OAB is any operator, its expectation value in the state psi is given by the usual definition, but that's equivalent to the trace 
what I'll call trace AB is the trace in the Hilbert space AJ tensor HB. Instead of thinking of the expectation value as the matrix element in a state, you could say that it's the trace of the operator times the density matrix. And those formulas are equivalent because rho is the projection operator onto the state. Well, rho is the orthogonal projection operator onto a pure state. In particular, it's Hermitian, non-negative, and its trace is one, and it also has rank one. But suppose we're only going to observe the subsystem A. In our application, we'll only be observing the field on the right half of the line for positive x. Observing this is only the subsystem A means that the operator we consider is something O sub A on the Hilbert space HA, but it's the identity on HB. Now, the expectation value of this operator in the state psi AB is given by the same formula as before, the trace of rho AB times the operator. But for an operator of this kind, we can simplify the formula because we can take what's called a partial trace over B. A trace means you sum over all states. Well, if you like, you sum over diagonal matrix elements of the operator. And trace over AB means you sum over diagonal matrix elements in either the A or B subsystem. But in the B subsystem, nothing's happening. The operator is the identity. So you can just do the trace over the B subsystem and get what's called rho sub A. You, you do what's called a partial trace over the B subsystem. That means you sum over all possible states of B, keeping the state of A fixed, and you get a density matrix rho sub A. And for observations of the A subsystem only, we can get rid of the B subsystem and simply say, that the expectation value of the operator O sub A is the trace of O sub A times the density matrix rho sub A, where now the trace is taken for the A system only. And rho sub A is called the reduced density matrix for system A. In other words, for measurements on system A only, we can use the density matrix rho sub A, which is obtained from rho AB by taking a partial trace on HB. The definition of rho sub A ensures that it's Hermitian non-negative and has trace one, just like rho AB, but it does not necessarily have rank one. If psi AB is an entangled state, which just means any state that's not a tensor product of a state of system A and a state of system B, for any generic psi AB, rho A will have rank greater than one. An entangled state, as I said, is just any state that's not a tensor product of separate states of the two subsystems. So almost every quantum state is entangled. To imitate this in field theory, we first need a convenient representation of the ground state wave function psi. It's given by a path integral on the lower half plane. That's something we learned essentially from Feynman. To get the ground state wave function of any quantum system, you do a path integral over a half line. Well, you take imaginary time running from zero to minus infinity. So in this case, you make a lower half plane, but it's a Euclidean lower half plane where time is imaginary. Space runs horizontally. You specify boundary values, psi of phi left and phi right. Well, you compute a path integral. Uh, let me say it better. You compute a path integral in the lower half plane with the boundary conditions in which the boundary values phi left and phi right are specified. The only reason for the black dot is to remind us, in general, Feynman would say, to specify boundary values on the whole boundary. But here we've divided the boundary in halves, phi left, left and right halves. So we specify values phi left and phi right on the two halves. And we do a path integral on the lower half. So the path integral computes a wave function psi of phi left and phi right. Now, how do we make the pure state density matrix for this state? Well, we created the um, bra of the density matrix by a path integral in the lower half plane. So we'll similarly create a ket by a path integral in the upper half plane. So this picture where we do separate path integrals to produce the bra and the ket, 
is a way to con construct the pure state density matrix by path integrals. Now the partial trace that gives the density matrix for the right half only is accomplished by setting the fields phi left and the left halves of the picture to be equal and integrating over phi left. Well, so we literally want to set the fields here equal to the fields here. That's done in path intervals by just gluing the two together. So now we get a path integral that looks like this. I've glued together the left half here and the left half here, but I haven't done the gluing on the right halves. So I've drawn the picture with a small gap between the two right halves just so you can see the picture. And now we're doing a path integral on a cut plane. The angle, open angle of that cut is epsilon. It's, re it's really zero, but I've just drawn it like that so you can see the cut. It's a path integral on the whole plane with a cut on the positive real axis. The path integral computes a function rho of phi right and phi right prime, where phi right prime are the boundary values above the cut and phi right are boundary values below the cut. And this is the density matrix appropriate for making observations only on the positive half. However, this path integral can be understood in another way. I'm simply going to draw the same picture again, but I'm going to draw it in a way that emphasizes the fact that the plane before we made the cut has rotational symmetry, namely rotational symmetry around those endpoints. So I've drawn now the plane as a disk that still has a cut that emanates from the center of the disk. You can generate the cut plane by starting with a half line or ray if you like, and rotating it by a two pi angle around its endpoint. And you'll end up with the whole cut plane. That gives us a formula for the density matrix. If R is the operator that generates the rotation, since we want a two pi rotation, the density matrix is rho equals the exponential of minus two pi R. However, it's useful to write this formula in Lorentz signature. In Lorentz signature, R becomes the Lorentz boost operator K, because when you continue from Euclidean signature to Minkowski signature, a rotation is replaced by a Lorentz boost. So the density matrix becomes e to the minus two pi times the boost generator K. Except for one detail, which is that since rho is a density matrix acting on a state defined only on the positive half space, say positive x, likewise here, k is a Lorentz boost generator defined only in that half line. So k is given by this expression, acting on quantum states that only live on the half line of non-negative x. I've written this as if there's only one dimension, but if there are additional spatial coordinates, they've been perpendicular to everything I've said, and they would be included in this integral. In fact, we will include them later. So as usual for a charge generator, in this case, the charge being the Lorentz boost, the integrals over space, here a half space at a fixed time, which I've taken to be time zero. Now we can go back to our formula and get a new understanding of why it led to a thermal density matrix. Observations near future infinity, which meant that T was very, very, very large, are equivalent to observations made near the horizon with U positive, but small. That comes from this formula. If T is large and positive, then U is small and positive. Since we're only making observations for positive U, our discussion applies. And in terms of U, the density matrix is the exponential of minus two pi times K. Let's convert that to the way it would be viewed by an observer at infinity. The Lorentz boost operator acts on u by u d by the u. But using this formula, we see that u d by the u from the point of view of the observer at infinity is minus four g m times d by dt. The generator d by dt corresponds to the Hamiltonian h. So the mapping from u to t maps k to 4 g m h, and therefore the density matrix e to the minus two pi k becomes e to the minus eight pi g m times h. 
And as I remarked in answering the question about imaginary time and thermal density matrices, this is the same as a thermal density matrix at the Hawking temperature, one over eight pi gm. In other words, I wrote it before as e to the minus h over t. So to make that true, t has to be one over one over this expression eight pi gm. Now, with a little more time, I'd go on to explain the Euclidean picture, which one of the questioners asked about but I won't be able to squeeze it into these lectures. It would come at the expense of navigate, navigating towards some of the contemporary results. So everything I've said until now is from the 70s and much more was also discovered in the 70s. I've told you the bare minimum you need to know from the old results to understand what I'll say about the more modern results. And therefore I'm leaving out a lot of wonderful things that were discovered in the 70s. Progress in the 21st century has largely depended on understanding the meaning of quantum entropy at a deeper level. One of the earliest and most easily explained results was by Horacio Cassini in 2008. And I'm going to be heading toward explaining it. So a key input is to discuss more thoroughly what entropy means at the quantum level. So, well, what is entropy? The original definition of entropy in terms of microphysics was by Boltzmann in the 19th century. Consider a system of n particles in a box with positions x and momenta p. As a classical physicist, Boltzmann assumed that at a given time, x and p have definite values, even if we do not know them. He described the state of our knowledge by a probability distribution function rho of p and x that encodes our knowledge. And after great labor, he defined the entropy as the phase space integral of minus rho log rho. I should explain that before Boltzmann, it was already known that in therm an understanding thermal systems, there's an important quantity that, we, that came to be called entropy. Boltzmann was trying to find a microscopic interpretation of entropy and this is the formula he arrived at after tremendous work. Now, for a quantum system, the density matrix rho, which we introduced earlier, is the closest analog of the classical probability distribution function. So recall that if a system is described by density matrix rho, then the expectation value of any observable O is the trace of O times rho. Now rho is a Hermitian matrix that moreover is positive semi-definite. So we can diag and moreover its trace is one. So we can diagonalize it with diagonal eigenvalues lambda j, which are all real and positive. And computing the expectation value of O in the basis in which the density matrix is, is diagonal, we see that the expectation value of O is the sum of lambda i times O sub i i. Well, O sub i i is the value that O would have if the system were in the state corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda i of the density matrix. So this formula is as if the system is in state i with probability lambda i. And that interpretation makes sense because since rho is non-negative and the trace of rho is one, the lambda i are non-negative and their sum is one. So the quantum analog of Boltzmann's integral is the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix. You see, the integral dp dx corresponds to the, it's the classical version of a sum over all states. It's an integral, classically, it's an integral over all phase space. What classically is all phase space quantum mechanically becomes all states. Integrating over all phase space becomes a trace over all states. And the classical distribution function rho becomes the quantum density matrix rho. So the Boltzmann integral goes over to the von Neumann entropy, except for one thing, which is that the von Neumann entropy is completely well-defined. Well, Boltzmann had a problem that he and his contemporaries knew about and puzzled over with this formula, which is that dimensionally, it doesn't quite make sense because dp dx has dimensions of action. It's not dimensionless. 
So Boltzmann's formula had a problem in normalization. So as we now know, the correct statement is that the quantum formula in a classical limit goes over to Boltzmann's formula with dpdx replaced by dpdx over two pi h bar. So Planck's constant gives the missing normalization that Boltzmann lacked and the von Neumann entropy goes over to the classical entropy. So as I said, the von Neumann entropy goes over to the classical entropy times a constant that's poorly defined classically. Now, if rho is, has, has eigenvalues lambda one up to lambda n, then the von Neumann entropy is given by this expression. You just calculate the trace in a basis where rho is diagonal. And so what can we say about it? Well, one thing is that if we know the state of a system with certainty, that means that one of the lambdas is one and the others are zero, so that rho has rank one. If that's the situation, then the formula gives entropy zero, which should be the right answer if the state of a system is known with certainty. Now, if there's more, if it, if the system state is not known with certainty, then since the sum of the lambdas is one, they're all less than one. And that means they all make positive contributions to this formula. So if the state of a system is not known with certainty, then the entropy is strictly positive. You can also ask what's the maximum possible entropy of a quantum system with n states. And I'll leave it as an exercise to try to show that the maximum possible entropy is log n. So the logarithm of the number of available states is the maximum that the von Neumann entropy could be. If a system is entangled with something else, then rho has rank greater than one, and therefore it has entropy positive. But there's a fundamental difference between the classical and quantum cases. Classically, we assume that X and P have actual values, even if we don't know them, and that if we're describing a system by a distribution function rho of p and x, that's because of a lack of microscopic knowledge. Quantum mechanically, a system can have a microscopic or fine-grained entropy, even if we has a, have as full a description of its state as quantum mechanics allows. That happens because of entanglement. So, I'll actually just re recapitulate a couple of things we said before. Suppose that A and B are two quantum systems in an overall pure state, psi AB. Because psi is a pure state, the density matrix of the combined system is a rank one projection operator, and the combined system has zero entropy. However, suppose that psi AB is entangled. Then the density matrix rho sub A of system A, a has rank greater than one, and system A has a positive von Neumann entropy. If A and B are entangled, this can be verified experimentally. And that means that there's no way to describe system A by a pure state density matrix with zero entropy. Even if you describe the situation as precisely as quantum mechanics allows, system A has a positive entropy. Of course, in general, just as classically, our knowledge of the state of the system might be less complete than quantum mechanics allows. In that case, we describe a system by a density matrix rho that reflects our knowledge. For example, if we know nothing about the state of a system, we would take rho to be a multiple of the identity, even if someone else who maybe knows how it was prepared would describe it by a pure state. If we know nothing about a system except its temperature, then the density matrix is a multiple of the exponential of minus beta h, where beta is one over the temperature. So in answering a question, I wrote the same formula. Well, I forgot to factor one over z, but I wrote the same formula in terms of t, which is one over beta. So if this is the density matrix, then the von Neumann entropy is the thermodynamic entropy, a familiar concept classically. What's different about quantum mechanics is the entropy that remains if our knowledge of the state of a system is as complete as quantum mechanics allows. That's been called entanglement entropy because it results from the entanglement of a system with some other system 
It's also been called fine-grained entropy, meaning that it's the entropy that's left when you know a system as perfectly as it can be known. Now, the idea that the Bakunzin Hawking entropy of a black hole should be understood in terms of entanglement entropy was apparently first put forward by Raphael Sorkin in 1983 in a paper that attracted only modest attention at the time. The idea was the following. In quantum field theory, divide space into two regions, A and B. So I gave the example before where we had a line and we divided it to the positive half and the negative half, but more generally, take any two regions, A and B. Let psi be any state, for example, the vacuum state. And let rho sub A be the reduced density matrix of the vacuum for the state psi. One can try to calculate the fine-grained entropy S sub A of the vacuum just for region A. One finds that it's ultraviolet divergent, but the coefficient of the divergence is proportional to the area A of the boundary between regions A and B. Sorkin's idea in modern language was that somehow gravity cuts off the ultraviolet divergence, leaving an entanglement entropy in the vacuum between the two regions. That's going to be the Bakunzin Hawking entropy A over 4G, where A is the area of the boundary between them. That makes a lot of intuitive sense as it matches two ideas. One idea is that A over 4G is the irreducible entropy for someone who has access only to the region outside the horizon. That basically is how Bekenstein introduced it, it, the black hole entropy. He said that an observer outside, not knowing what's inside, should attribute an entropy over 4G to the black hole. But the second idea is that the divergence in the entanglement entropy is proportional to A, as I mentioned a moment ago, that's true because it comes from short distance, short wavelength modes near the horizon. So when you calculate here, okay, concretely you'll do a calculation with some kind of quantum loop amplitudes. That means a quantum particle will be moving around in some orbit in space time. If it's only in region A, it won't contribute to entanglement A and B. If it's only in region B, it won't contribute. The entanglement comes from particle orbits. Maybe I should even draw one. Uh, particle orbits uh, you see if, if, if a virtual quantum particle runs around an orbit that goes from A to B and back that'll contribute to the entanglement entropy between A and B and you'll have to integrate over the size of the orbit as always for quantum, quantum mechanics but you get a divergence for the very small orbits and because a very small orbit could be anywhere the number of very small orbits is proportional to the area in between the two. So the divergent part of the entanglement entropy is proportional to the area of the dividing boundary. And Sorkin's suggestion was that black hole is something like that, black hole entropy is something like that, with the black hole horizon playing the role of the boundary of region A. Region A is supposed to be the region where we're able to make measurements, and the fine-grained entropy of in region A is this entanglement entropy with the region we're not seeing. And then Sorkin pointed out that that's naturally proportional to the area of the boundary surface with a coefficient that in ordinary quantum field theory is divergent. But he proposed that in fact, with gravity, that divergence would be cut off. And, oh, sorry. I want to get rid of the pictures I drew or we'll keep seeing them. In ordinary quantum theory without gravity, you get an area entropy, but the coefficient is infinite. But um, Sorkin's idea was that somehow gravity cuts off the divergence. To say it in one other way, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is A over 4G. Well, what does it mean to not have gravity? Not having gravity is like Newton's constant being zero. 
In the limit where Newton's constant goes to zero, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy would be infinite. And as Sorkin showed, the entanglement entropy in ordinary quantum theory without gravity is infinite. So you see, no one has ever fully been able to compute the Bekenstein Hawking entropy from first principles in the generality we really, really like to understand. But Sorkin proposed that this calculation, the simp rather simple calculation he did, explaining the infinity due to the small loops that I've erased by now, is the small g limit of a real calculation with gravity that would give a over 4g. And I think most observers, most researchers believe that in some sense that's correct. It matches two facts that, well, a over 4g is supposed to be the entropy for someone who has access only to the region outside the horizon. And the divergence in the entanglement entropy comes from short wavelength modes near the horizon, as if after cutting off the divergence, there was one unit of entropy for every unit of area, as in Wheeler's picture. Now, Soskine and Uglin made the following very simple observation. And I think I'll briefly explain that and then we'll stop there for today. Let's remember the generalized entropy, A over 4 GH bar plus the entropy outside. And now we're going to, so the entropy outside, remember, is supposed to be the entropy of ordinary matter outside the black hole. Okay. Beckenstein said it was the entropy of ordinary matter and radiation outside the black hole. But what exactly is meant by that? Well, we're going to follow Sorkin and refine it to mean that S out is the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix outside the black hole. That's a more subtle definition because it includes matter and radiation outside the black hole, but it also includes these quantum fluctuations near the horizon, which I was talking about when I talked about these short orbits near the, near the dividing surface. So, so well, following Sorkin, Soskine and Oglin reinterpreted S out as being the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix outside the black hole. Now, I've told you that with that interpretation of S out, it's ultraviolet divergent because of the short orbits. But Soskine and Oglin pointed out that A over 4G is also ultraviolet divergence because general relativity coupled to matter is ultraviolet divergent. Well, string theory was invented to eliminate those divergences, but in ordinary physics, uh, Newton's constant suffers what's called an infinite normalization due to matter in any quantum calculation. So Soskin and Oglin pointed out that not only is S out divergence, as Sorkin had noted, but A over 4G is divergent, and better yet, the two divergences cancel. So to the extent you can calculate in perturbation, you discover that each term is ill-defined but the sum seems to be better defined than either term is separately. So 21st century developments have supported these ideas, though leaving us with plenty of mysteries. Now, my next topic is going to be, okay, this is a very nice observation by Soskine and Oglin, but it's not quantitative. Uh, so what happened in the last 15 years was that people started to discover things you could say that were more quantitative, that were based on reinterpreting S out as the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix. And I think without rushing too much, I can't explain that today. So I'll postpone beginning that till the second lecture. And what I'll start with in the second lecture is explaining what's called the Beckenstein bound, a refinement Beckenstein made a few years later of his original idea that I told you about today. And then, People struggled for decades about whether the Beckenstein bound was true or what it even should mean. And then I'll explain that by interpreting entropy as von Neumann entropy, Cassini was able to interpret the Beckenstein bound in a sensible way and prove it. So that'll be our, uh, that'll be most of the second lecture, I would say. Anyway, thank you for today. And perhaps there are some more questions. Okay. Um 
there was one question uh, in the meantime. Uh, it was about entanglement entropy. Uh, this is small orbit you drew in this uh, the diagram, mm -hmm. couple of slides ago. The question was, does this virtual particle loop mean the particle inside the horizon can escape to outside? Oh, well, certainly the particle can't escape. So a virtual loop, okay. Um, the discussion I gave here is much clearer in Minkowski space than in, or in an ordinary space time without gravity. So, okay. Okay. Well, the answer is certainly no, because the closed loop that we use to compute the entropy just goes around in circles, as I drew it, in fact. So the entropy, the entanglement entropy is computed technically from closed orbits, so they don't go anywhere, whether there's a black hole or not. Uh, but this idea was stated in this way by Sorkins, who was very naive. Well, his observation was just that this was some kind of entropy that's proportional to the area. Unfortunately, with an infinite co constant, if there's no gravity, no gravity, he said, is like G being zero. And then he suggested that in the real world with G being not zero, you get the Beckinson Hawking entropy. No calculation that backs this up properly. All kinds of things are known that I won't have time to explain in these lectures. So, uh, but, uh, anyway, so uh, I hope perhaps I answered the question. Otherwise, there might be a follow up. Okay. So, if there is a question, please raise your hand. Or if you do not have know how to do that, please speak up. Uh, I, I would like to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah, don't so first. Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, uh, the question is about this uh, S out, uh, definition of S out. Yes. Uh, so, uh, for instance, I mean, uh, if we consider uh, a black hole in our universe, yes. S out include the uh, standard model, all the standard model metals mm -hmm. uh, together with the uh, uh, graviton contribution. Uh, is, is that? S out should include the graviton contribution, although it's harder to do computations when you try to include it. But conceptually, certainly, S out includes the graviton contribution. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, there is a question from K Pan Xi. Uh, hi, I have a question. So, when deriving the black hole temperature, you have used the relation between U and T. However, that is uh, just a leading order approximation. So does this mean the Hawking temperature is also a leading order approximation? No, was, well, let's go back to the slide where I wrote that relation, if I can find it quickly. I tried to explain why only the leading order was relevant. Okay. Uh, you see. Well. Okay. Suppose you add a correction of order u to this formula, for example. Then, uh, well, this relation, of course, is changed, but it's changed. Okay. This formula, well, okay. this, well, what this formula is, it's asymptotically exact as t becomes large. So that means in the case of, okay. Corrections are exponentially small. Okay. Let me recommend you do an exercise. Replace this order u term by u and try to solve this for u. You'll have trouble doing it, unfortunately. You, I think, won't be able to solve it exactly, but you should be able to understand how big the corrections are. And you should be able to see that the corrections are incredibly small when t is large. So um, the statement is that when transients die down, the Hawking radiation becomes exact. And you're going to find some transients there, but not the dominant ones, I don't think. We've got something extremely small if you put an order U term correction here in this formula. I see. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, there is a question from Zhou Yangju. Oh, uh, hi. Thanks for your nice presentation. And I have two questions about now. The first is, I wonder, the 
particles that from the black hole uh, going out from the black hole is the main things that affect about as out. I didn't understand the question. Sorry. Please repeat. Uh, uh, you said that uh, there is a orbit or a couple of particles around the surface of the black hole. And the particles can escape the black holes. Classically, they cannot escape, but Hawking discovered that quantum mechanically they do. Yes. I, I wonder that these particles escape many effects the S up. Either at the end of the second lecture or the beginning of the third, we'll calculate the contribution of the outgoing particles to S out. Ah, okay. Thank you. And... Two, two previous questioners asked me the following question. When a black hole is emitting Hawking radiation, S out increases, but A over 4G goes down. So is the generalized second law true? So we will discuss that. Although it's not the next thing. I'm not sure if we'll get to it in the second lecture or not. Probably toward the end of the second lecture. Uh, you need to go on. Uh, Sok has a question, Sok Kim. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk first. Uh, I have a bit, I'm a bit confused about the Soskind and Oglum uh, argument results that you explained. Um, yes. When you're first introducing Sorokin's result, I thought that entanglement entropy had divergence proportional to area. But if yes. you somehow regularize them, it will give rise to finite result proportional to area. Am I right? That's true, but there's no uh, justification to regularize it. It's only. Uh, yeah. And in terms of Saskia and Uglam's formula con consisting of two terms, area plus S out, does, yes. did you say that Sorokin's virtual particle contribution contributes to S out only? Yes. And then in terms of entanglement entropy, how should we interpret the first term? Area well, divided by, yeah. The answer to your question is that nobody knows. That's the big mystery, I would say. Uh, but but oh, so, 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 me, so the first term should be somehow, it, I mean, let me tell you that entanglement entropy, but nobody knows what it come from. Is that the right thing? You're, mess, you're asking the right question. Uh, that's the central mystery in the field. So I'll give you a heuristic answer, but it's only heuristic. The real answer is that nobody knows. S out is the part of the entanglement entropy you know how to calculate. Uh -huh. Over four GH bar is the part of the entanglement entropy you don't know how to calculate because it involves short distance physics we don't know. Uh, the separation between the two is a little bit imperfect because it's not clear up to what energy. When you say that, it means you should cut off S out at some high energy up to which we know the physics. And above that, we should use better physics that we don't know. Mm. But it's a little bit up to you where you want to put the cut up dividing between the two. So Soskine and Uglum showed that it's natural, mm. at least in, well, so later authors who I haven't listed here, unfortunately, did this with more technical precision than Soskine and Uglum. But Soskine and Uglum showed the basic idea that in perturbation theory, this sum is better behaved than either term. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Fortunately, there are all kinds of, okay. I won't be able to explain the derivation of that either in these lectures, although it's actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I chose the topics for the second and third lecture to be things that are illustrative of contemporary developments, relatively easy to understand, but nevertheless, get you in the frame of mind of understanding contemporary developments. And I didn't want to explain the Saskan and Uglum in detail because it's relatively old and they actually explained it quite well. I couldn't improve on what they said. And, but to, uh, well, anyway. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, can I add one more question to that? I mean, this area term in this formula. Yes. In what sense is it divergent? You mean because it has M plan? Because G is divergent. Uh, you see, okay, what do you mean by A over 4 G H bar? G, the G in the formula, okay. Do you think G is the bare G or the renormalized observed? Oh, I see, in that sense, I see, I understand. Thank so you. there's an ultraviolet divergence in the, 
quantum field theory is divergent in general and general relativity is badly divergent. So at the one loop order, for example, the renormalized Newton's constant, or I should say the renormalized one over Newton's constant is one over the bare Newton's constant plus something divergent, quadratically divergent. So, uh, yeah. so the divergence in one over G is just in the relation between the bare Newton constant and the renormalized Newton constant. So Beckenstein didn't worry about it. He just wrote the formula with Newton's constant. Right. As far as I know, authors before Soskind and Uglin did the same. Soskind and Uglin said that to make sense, the formula is in terms of the renormalized Newton's constant, which we observe in the real world, not the bare Newton's constant. And there's an ultraviolet divergence in the relation between the two. And they showed that the that ultraviolet divergence exactly cancels the divergence in SL. Okay, they showed it at the one loop level, but when you see the argument, it's kind of clear at general and well, uh, I was satisfied that I haven't really studied in detail the papers of the authors who did it more carefully. There's a question from uh, Yi Han. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask one thing about the idea of circuits. Mm -hmm. uh, so he divided this space into two parts, A and B. Does that yes. mean that the, he divided the Hilbert space into two parts so we can uh, properly normalize the state in each subspaces? Well, uh, roughly speaking, yes. So roughly speaking, there's a Hilbert space H A for region A and a Hilbert space H B for region B. And the big Hilbert space is the tensor product. And then you make the reduced density matrix of region A. That would be technically correct in a lattice theory, a theory with a cutoff. In continuum quantum field theory, it's not quite technically correct. And that's related to the fact that the, ultra, that the entanglement entropy, when you try to calculate it, is ultraviolet diversion. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? There was a uh, uh, Song Han Wu who <laughs> put a question on chat and he's waving on, uh, with his hand raised. Maybe that would be the last question. Song okay. Han Wu? Yes, uh, when you define the density matrix, there is the orange boost operator. But, uh, when you, when you consider the gravitating system, is it possible to preserve in the Lorentz boost symmetry? Is it possible to what? Preserve the Lorentz boost symmetry. symmetry. Well, I mean, Lorentz boost symmetry is valid locally in general relativity. It's valid globally in an asymptotically flat space time. Um, but in any case, I'd like to stress that when I made the statement about the density matrix of quantum field theory in a half space, this was statement, that was for ordinary quantum field theory without gravity. Okay. All right, uh, it's uh, already 11.30 or 10.30 for Edward. So maybe it's time to close this session and look forward to the next one, uh, two days from now, uh, same time. Uh, let us thank Edward again. Uh, well, thank you for the attention and see you all in two days. <laughs>